ratings of the Bible in a year. January 24th, Genesis 25, Matthew 24, Esther chapter 1, and Acts 24. Abraham took another wife, whose name was Keturah. She bore him Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Jokshan fathered Sheba and Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim, Latushim, and Leumim. It's a hard name. The sons of Midian were Epha, Epher, Hanok, um, Abida, and Eldaah. These were the children of Keturah. Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. But to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. While he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac, eastward, to the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, in the uh, son of Zohar the Hittite, east of Mamre, the field that Abraham purchased from the Hittites. There Abraham was buried with Sarah his wife. After the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy. These are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in order of their birth, Nebioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kadar, Abdil, Ibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, uh, Tema, Jatur, Nafish, and Kadema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their encampments. Twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt, in the direction of of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to Yahweh for his wife because she was barren, and Yahweh granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of Yahweh, and Yahweh said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When days to give birth were completed, or when her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Jacob meaning, takes by the heel, he treats, or trickster. Isaac was 60 years old when he bore them, or rather when she bore them, he didn't bear the children. When the uh, boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, uh, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of the red stew, for I am exhausted. Therefore his name was called Edom, meaning, it sounds like the Hebrew word for red. Jacob said, Sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what, use a, of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to, to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. That is all the notes to hear. Let's move on to Matthew 24.
Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him all the buildings of the temple. But he answered, You see all these, don't you? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that I rather that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's three separate questions they were asking, but they thought it was all the same. Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, put you to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then, and will come. So, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house, and let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant in those, and for those who are nursing infants in those days, Pray that your flight might not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and will never be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead to astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. And if they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and it puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that he is near at the very gates Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. But heaven and earth will pass away. My words will not pass away. But concerning that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. Started scrolling through the notes here on the side, and it shifted where we were. Give me a moment. Ah, there we go. Verse 38. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, or giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in one field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household? to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over, his, or over all his possessions. But if, that, um, but if that wicked servant says to himself, my, my master is delayed, begins to, to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces, and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Move on to Esther chapter 1. Let's go ahead and read the introduction here. The book of Esther never mentions God's name. Yet God clearly orchestrated all of its events. A sovereign God ruling over nations and people for his his good pleasure. Esther, a Jew living among the exiles in Persia, became queen of the empire in about 480 BC. Haman, a Persian official, sought to eradicate this Jewish minority. But God had prepared Esther, quote, for such a time as this, unquote chapter 4, verse 14, to save his covenant people. The book was written some decades later to document the origins of the Jewish observance of Purim, which celebrates Israel's survival and God's faithfulness. The author is unknown, but some believe it could have been Esther's cousin, Mordecai, who is a key person in this book. Throughout the book, we see God's sovereign hand preserving his people, showing that everything is under his control. Let's begin. Now, in the days of Ahasuerus, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, In the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Media and the nobles and governors uh, of the provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave for uh, all the people a present in Susa, the citadel, both small and great a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars, and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels vessels of of different kinds, and royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. And drinking was according to this edict. There is no compulsion. For the king had given orders to all the staff of the palace to do as each man desired. Queen Vashti also gave a feast for the women in the palace that belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he was drunk, he summoned, rather, he commanded uh, Mehuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and um, Abagtha, 
Zethar, and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and, and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. We don't know specifically what that meant. Like in any real detail, there are some notes on here with some, some ideas behind it. But we're thinking that there was something weird with it. And we'll get to that right now, verse 12. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged and his anger burned within him. Again, read the notes on this. There's a lot of um, ideas about what could have been happening. Then the king said to the wise men who knew the times, for this was the king's procedure toward uh, all who were versed in law and judgment. And the men next to him, being Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Merez, uh, Arsena, and Mimukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti, because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Memukin said in the presence of the king and all the officials, Not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the people who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the, the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath and plenty. If it please the king, let a royal order go out from him. Let it be written among uh, the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus. And let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, for it is vast, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the princess. And the king did as Mebuchan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and of every people in its own language, and every man be master, rather, that every man be master in his own household, and speak according to the language of his people. That is all the reading and notes to hear. Let's conclude today in Acts 24. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders, and a spokesman, one Tertullus, and they laid before the governor their case against Paul. When he had been summoned, Tertullus began to accuse him, saying, Since through you we enjoy much peace, and since by your foresight, most excellent Felix, reforms are being made for this nation. In every way and everywhere, we accept, that we accept this with all gratitude. To detain you no further, I beg you in your kindness to hear us briefly. For we have found this man a plague. One who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world. And who is a, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. That's another name for Christians. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. By examining him yourself, you will be able to find out from him about everything of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in this charge, affirming that all these things were so. When the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul replied, Knowing that for many years you have been judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify. It is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, again, the Christian life, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, 
believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves the, the, these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. After several years, I came to bring alms to my nation and to present offerings. While I was doing this, they found me purified in the temple, without any crowd or tumult. But some Jews from Asia, that they ought to be here before you, to make an accusation, should they have anything against me. Or else, let these men themselves say what wrongdoing they found when I stood before the council, other than this one thing, that I cried out while standing among them. It is with respect to the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he, Paul, should be kept in custody, but to have some liberty, that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs, after some days, Felix came uh, with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard from him speak about, rather, heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And he reasoned in, about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, g g go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When two years had elapsed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. And that is all the reading and all the notes for today. God willing, we'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.